Hello guys, this is Jonathan Oakes, and today I'm going to be talking about online dating as a mating strategy. So as opposed to traditional dating in person, online dating in theory seems like a really good mating strategy. Now, of course, we're trying to meet this evolutionary problem of selecting and keeping a mate. So a long-term mate means reproductive success and parental cooperation, which ensures the survival of the offspring and of course, the survival of that individual's genetics. So theoretically, online dating does provide this access to the large amount of potential mates and it requires this minimal amount of investment. You know, you don't really have to go out and seek these mates they are all right there online for you. So one thing we can be sure of is that online dating is very popular. One fifth of committed relationships begin online. 66% of users have dated someone they met online and 49 million people have tried online dating. With all this popularity, clearly there's something going on here. There's, there's something working, but you know, of course this problem requires a little bit more investigation. The most important questions we want to answer here is that despite its popularity, you know, is online dating really more effective than traditional in-person dating? Because, you know, traditional in-person dating and courtship was done for more than 99% of our evolutionary history. This is a, you know, only recent, you know, last decade or so type of event. You know, is online dating really that much better than what we've been doing for so long in our evolution? And, you know, I think the ultimate thing that will help us answer that is how effective is online dating at creating long term relationships that we mentioned at the beginning that are the most effective at spreading our genetics? So, to start, let's look at some of the pros and cons for online dating. So obviously we have the pros, of course, access to more potential mates. There's so many people online who you have potential access to, to talk with and potentially match with. Um, there's no physical proximity boundaries. So you can set your location to anywhere in the world in online dating and meet people all around you, all over the globe. And of course, you have these algorithms that are closely guarded secrets by these online dating services that help match the right type of people based off either information you enter in as the user or that is generated in the background. And of course, we have the cons, which I think we're going to pay some particular attention to because these cons are actually very uh, important. Choice overload is of course you have so many people that you have potential access to that you could you know sabotage your own um, your own efforts to get a solid relationship and we'll go more into that later um, and another one is of course algorithms cannot account for real life chemistry you know you can have this match created via these these factors that you submit or by this computer reading your behavior but you know, of course, the true test of that is in person. You know, you really can't read a lot online like that. Um, and then lastly, users often lie. You know, they're lying about who they are and what they do. And of course, that's not terrible, but, you know, re really people want to see some honesty and they don't want to have this image of a person that they're presenting, but rather, you know, the real individual before their eyes because that's ultimately the one they're going to meet in reality. So now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this choice overload con that I had mentioned before and particularly we're going to look at this in the implication for women. So this is why this is a bad thing for women. So we're going to talk about this concept of this rejection mindset. So the continued access to virtually unlimited potential partners makes people more pessimistic and rejecting. So this study by Tila M. Prong, having extensive choice can have various adverse effects, such as paralysis, not making a decision at all, 
and decreased satisfaction. So people gradually close off from mating opportunities. That means that the more they use the app and the service, the more they close off from potential people. And you know, when this choice set increases, people end up being less satisfied with their ultimate ultimate partner choice and more prone to reverse their decision. You know, they get more choosy, they get more unsure of themselves because of just how much they have. Um, and for women, this rejection mindset also resulted in a decreased likelihood of having romantic matches. So for women seeking long-term relationships, they're potentially uh, filtering out lots of these men who would make good romantic partners. And this is, you know, kind of a problem. And this is not a problem in traditional dating where opportunities are more limited to physical proximity and community groups. You see these people more in person and you're not, you know, so paralyzed by indecision. You really have an honest appraisal of who's around you. Okay, and now we're gonna look at the same con, the choice overload, but for the perspective of men, you know, why does this, why does this hurt men's chances? So this abundance of choices for women leads to increased selectivity. So this leads to an imbalance between male and female prospects. So females are already very choosy when it comes to selecting a partner. And when you add a lot of options for them, this creates a massive like bias towards the top 20% of men. So this is a statistic cited. So the bottom 80% of men in terms of attractiveness are competing for the bottom 20, 22% of women. And the top 78% of women are competing for the top 20% of men. So if you look over at the uh, upper right chart, you can see the massive increase between one and 10 for the top 80 to 100% of male attractiveness. So that's a huge rate in like percentage just based on attractiveness alone. And this isn't you know, the woman's fault, it's just because they have so many choices, they're automatically going for the most attractive men they can get. And this creates a lot of inequality for men because you know the vast majority of us under, you know, <laughs> are under this top 20%. So this is the bottom 80% of men are really not getting access to those same opportunities and they lose a lot of that, that opportunity. So this is a definitely a huge imbalance unless you're in the top 20% of men, which most of us aren't. So now looking at another con, we have algorithms. So like we mentioned before, Yes, dating apps and services have this algorithm that can help you match better with others, but in practice, this doesn't really lead to increased success. So we've got multiple citations here. Limiting the prospect pool does not improve success. So just by reducing the amount of people that you're exposed to by trying to match you better, uh, this isn't translating to better success. And these, these members that they're introducing you to are random prospects, which is, isn't really any different than meeting random strangers anywhere in person. And of course, there's no way for these sites to know how people will really interact offline. And these algorithms cannot account for deeper psychological issues. So like, no matter if you get along supposedly perfectly because you answer some questions the same as somebody else on a dating site, uh, that doesn't account for, you know, any kind of a uh, psychological or personality issues they might have that might otherwise detract you from that person. Um, as we can see on the bottom, similarity on personality traits and attitudes have no effect on relationship well-being. So some of these questions they might be asking really have no effect on overall happiness in these already established relationships. So that's totally missing the mark. And here we can see one of the biggest problems that online dating suffers from. And, you know, in this study of 1,000 online daters, 53% of people admitted to having lied in their online dating profile. So approximately half of people are, are being dishonest about something about their lives as they're being advertised and presented on this website. So most common lies 
or about financial situations. People are literally lying about what job they have to seem more appealing. And other common lies include, you know, age, women claim that they're younger than they really are, height, men claim an average of two inches taller than they are, weight, and both men and women claim slender body types and use older photos probably when they were more attractive, younger, and in better shape. So obviously in traditional dating and courtship, individuals cannot lie about physical features or other details in their life as easily. This allows for more realistic appraisal, obviously, of who you might be interested in. And, you know, you're not getting this idealized representation of them online. You're getting the actual person right in front of you. So now we know there are some serious cons to online dating, but the proof is in whether it is really able to perform as an effective long-term mating strategy. And sadly, the statistics here aren't looking too promising either. So according to research conducted at Michigan State University, relationships that started out online are 28% more likely to break down in their first year than relationships where their couples met face to face. Now, this doesn't seem like that extreme of a statistic, though it is still measurable. Um, but the biggest one, I think, is couples who met online are nearly three times as likely to get divorced as couples that met face to face face to face. And when you consider that 50% of marriages roughly end in divorce, that's a pretty high number. So that really discredits online dating's ability to create lasting relationships. And now that doesn't mean that, you know, lasting relationships from online dating don't exist. And I'm sure there's plenty of happy individuals who met online. But what this shows is that statistically, this isn't creating as much success as we would like, and it's really discrediting its ability to be considered a good mating strategy going by our own definition. So now just to conclude everything we've talked about so far when evaluating online dating as a mating strategy. So while it does offer this abundance of potential mates, which isn't limited by physical proximity, um, as shown by choice overload, this can be seen as a hindrance because, you know, by making women more selective, uh, they're potentially missing these potential long-term relationships they could be having by being far more selective towards attractive men and, you know, obviously men that they consider much better on the hierarchy. And then these vast majority of males are losing access to the vast majority of females because of this way of making women far more selective. They just have far too many choices and this is causing them to be unsatisfied and be far too choosy and potentially um, deny men that they would otherwise probably get along with fine had they met in person. Now, online dating algorithms also do not account for deeper psychological issues that may otherwise be detectable in person and do not reliably predict matching success, which is another uh, problem that online dating has. Uh, the vast majority of individuals present an inaccurate representations of themselves, aka lying, creating this potential dissatisfaction and harming, you know, the long-term prospects because nobody likes an individual who lies and that's definitely going to stick out during the relationship. And, you know, online dating does not reliably create long-term relationships. And I think this is the biggest kicker of all of this because, you know, like we said, um, mating success is all about creating long-term relationships so you know you have kids you raise these kids together and this ensures the survival of our genetics and it's not reliably creating this online dating so despite all of this um there are groups that online dating works for quite well um, and it can really be surmised that online dating is good for two groups, women interested in pursuing short-term flings and men who could be considered in the top 20% of attractiveness. So considering that 60% of women using online dating are not looking for hookups, aka short-term flings, and 80% of men are under that top 20% of attractiveness and thereby limited in prospects, 
It can be said that online dating is not an effective mating strategy for the ma vast majority of men and women, and it's particularly ineffective long-term mating strategy in the majority of cases. You know, we're hardly creating long-term mating strategies to begin with, which really doesn't make it overall that good of an idea, except for those two rare cases. It seems better to create short-term experiences and heavily biases um, men who are considered the top 20% of attractiveness. Now, if you look at the way that most people tend to meet, you'll see that the vast majority of people meet their partners through their friends at a bar or restaurant, their coworkers, um, through family, school, and online only represents about 10% there, roughly. Um, and that's pretty small compared to all of the other places people tend to form, you know, happy, successful relationships. You know, while online dating is convenient by, you know, all measures, I mean, it's very easy to use and have access to all these potential mates, it really isn't as popular nor as effective in creating these long-term relationships. And that finishes my presentation. I'm sure this presentation may have raised some eyebrows or maybe made individuals question their usage of online dating, or maybe you guys have some questions or something. Feel free to ask. I'm open to discuss any of this. Of course, this is all my own research and my own hypothesis and opinions. So, you know, take whatever you read here with a grain of salt and with your own judgment. Thank you.